Okay, so now we're going to talk about fluid electrolyte and acid-base balance. Remember that's a big part of what your uh, urinary system does. Also, your respiratory system plays a little part in it, um, and a couple other systems play a part in fluid balance. The fluid compartments, most of your body's water, about 65% of it actually, resides inside the cells. This is what we call intracellular fluid, because intra means inside. The uh, other 35% is called extracellular fluid. It's outside of the cells, because extra means outside. Uh, this includes the fluid between the cells inside tissues, called interstitial fluid, as well as the fluid within vessels, like uh, blood plasma and lymph. Other extracellular fluids like cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid in the joints, the uh, vitreous and aqueous humors of the eyes, and the digestive secretions are called transcellular fluids. So intracellular and extracellular fluid continually mingle as fluid goes back and forth through the semi-permeable semi membrane that's surrounding each compartment. Uh, the concentration of solutes, solutes especially electrolytes, um, within each compartment determines the amount and the direction of flow. If the concentration of electrolytes uh, increases, then water moves out of the cells and into the tissues. Sorry, let me re -say that. Let me say that again. If the concentration of electrolytes of tissue fluid increases, water moves out of the cells and into the tissues. If the osmolarity or the concentration of electrolytes decreases, then water moves out of the tissues and into the cells. Uh, the passage of fluid happens really quickly, like within seconds, in order to main equi maintain equilibrium or homeostasis. Normally, the amount of water that's gained and lost by the body each day is uh, pretty equal. Uh, in adults, that's about 2,500 mLs of fluid each day. So you take in that much, you lose that much. Most fluid intake occurs through eating and drinking. The cells produce a fair amount of water as a byproduct of metabolic reactions, and this is what we call metabolic water. Um, and then fluid is lost through the kidneys as urine, the intestines and the feces, the skin by sweating as well as diffusion, and then the lungs through the air that you breathe out. Water loss varies depending on the temperature and you know, the amount of physical activity. Obviously, if you're more active and you work out, do your cardio, uh, you start sweating, you're going to lose more fluid. So you need to um, take in more, and your body's got some mechanisms to let you know how to do When the total body water declines, like excess sweating, like when you work out, blood pressure drops, sodium concentration rises, and osmolarity increases. This triggers mechanisms to increase intake as well as mechanisms to decrease output. Mechanisms to increase intake are like uh, feeling thirsty, um, salivation decreases, causing dry mouth, which makes you feel thirsty, so then you drink some water. Um, it's important to remember, though, that elderly, elderly adults have a diminished thirst sensation. So that's why elderly get dehydrated so easily, because they don't have that sense of thirst. They don't know to drink more when it's warmer outside. To decrease output, uh, the same factors that trigger the increased fluid intake, you know, the decreased blood pressure, the higher sodium, also trigger the mechanisms to decrease urine output. Um, like uh, your posterior pituitary will secrete the antidiuretic hormone, which then prompts the kidneys to reabsorb more water, make less urine, and fluid loss is slow until water is taken in. There are some disorders of water balance. I'm sure we've heard them. Fluid volume, fluid concentration uh, related to uh, abnormalities in those, plus abnormalities of fluid between compartments. Uh, fluid volume or fluid de depletion, deficiency. First, there is fluid depletion. This results from blood loss or the loss of both water and sodium. And then dehydration, it's a little different because that results when the body eliminates more water than sodium. So your sodium levels will be higher, but your fluid volume will be less. In dehydration, besides the loss of fluid, the concentration of sodium of the extracellular fluid increases, like we just talked about. This uh, increases the osmolarity, which prompts the shifting of fluid from one compartment to another uh, as a way to try to balance the concentration of sodium. Dehydration results from consuming uh, not enough water to cover the amount of water lost. 
Um, other causes, other things that can lead to dehydration include diabetes and the use of diuretics. When it's really severe, fluid deficiency can lead to circulatory collapse, and that's something that um, that's like a shutdown of, of your whole circulatory system. That's not something you want. Fluid excess, it is possible to have a fluid excess, and this is more than just your feet are a little swollen. Um, your kidneys usually compensate, so it's, it's not as common as fluid deficit. One thing that can lead to this, though, is renal failure or failure of your kidneys, um, in which both sodium and water are retained and the extracellular fluid remains isotonic. There is another type of thing called water intoxication. This can occur if someone consumes a, a really an excessive amount of water or if they replace heavy losses of water and sodium, like when you sweat a lot, with just water. This causes the amount of sodium in the extracellular fluid to drop. Water moves into the cells, which causes them to swell. Um, you can see this, like I, I saw this uh, when I went to watch a uh, marathon. The people running the marathon, if they did not take in enough water or a lot of the, almost every uh, hydration station, I think they called it, he had not only water, but also Gatorade for the runners to drink. If they didn't drink enough of either one of those, um, by the end of the marathon, their muscles were cramping up. Uh, they were having all sorts of problems from being dehydrated. Other complications that can occur include pulmonary edema, uh, which is a buildup of fluid around your lungs, or cerebral edema, which is an excess of fluid in your brain or in your skull. And you can imagine neither of those are very good either. Fluid can accumulate in any organ or tissue, but typically it will uh, accumulate and affect the lungs or the brain and then dependent areas like the legs, the feet, and the ankles. Um, a disturbance in any of the factors that regulate the movement of fluid between blood and the interstitial compartment, like electrolyte imbalances, uh, increased capillary pressure, and then decreased concentration of plasma proteins can trigger edema. Electrolytes really drive chemical reactions and they affect the distribution of the body's water content and determine a cell's electrical potential. Uh, the major cations of the body are sodium, potassium, calcium, and hydrogen. Those are the positively charged ones. And then the anions, the ones with a negative charge, are chloride, bicarbonate, and phosphates. Um, these are also important to the acid-base balance sodium for a minute. Sodium is the main electrolyte in extracellular fluid. It accounts for about 90% of the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. It plays a key role in depolarization. Remember from the nervous system, the depolarization of the membrane as an impulse was conducted. Uh, sodium rushed in, potassium rushed out. Um, so it's crucial for proper nerve and muscle function. If your sodium level is lower, your serum osmolarity is lower. Uh, aldosterone then will prompt the renal tubules to reabsorb sodium. The antidiuretic hormone is suppressed, so the kidneys will uh, secrete water and won't be reabsorbed. And then the sodium levels will increase. If your sodium levels are high, your serum osmolarity is high. The antidiuretic hormone will cause your kidneys to reabsorb more water. The ADH also stimulates thirst, so you'll drink some water, and then that will bring the sodium levels back down. Uh, problems with sodium imbalances, and it's important to remember the, uh, the technical names, uh, the medical terminology names, if you will, hypernatremia, hyper being um, high, and A referring to sodium, and tremia referring to blood. So plasma concentration is greater than 146. Uh, usually that indicates a fluid deficit. Uh, usually uh, your body is able to correct itself by triggering thirst in the way we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and then hyponatremia, hypo meaning low, and then Na again, sodium, and tremia meaning in the blood. Plasma concentration is less than 139. Um, I'm not going to expect you to know these exact numbers for our purposes here in a and but you are going to need to learn them when it comes to the other body systems in med surge, especially the cardiac and the respiratory. Uh, hyponatremia results from excess body water, uh, either drinking too much um, or not getting rid of enough. And uh, usually it is corrected by the excretion of excess water in your kidneys, of course. 
Potassium imbalances, this is probably the most dangerous of all electrolyte, imbal electrolyte imbalances. Hyperkalemia, again hyper, the Ka refers to potassium and then the emia refers to blood. That's a potassium level above 5. Um, it can occur suddenly or it can occur gradually and it makes nerves and muscle cells more irritable. It, this can happen after uh, suddenly after like a crush injury or a severe burn um, or it could occur gradually from the use of potassium sparing diuretics uh, which you're going to um, learn about when you get into the uh, circulatory system in uh, med surge. Um, renal insufficiency, um, but hyperkalemia can um, lead to some fatal cardiac arrhythmias, which uh, obviously by the word fatal is not good. Hypokalemia, and again hypo means low, K refers to potassium, and then the emia refers to blood. That's a potassium level less than 3.5. This can result from a uh, uh, extended use of potassium wasting diuretics, something like Lasix is probably the most common one. It can also happen um, if you've had a lot of vomiting or if you have chronic diarrhea. Uh, it makes cells less excitable, so you're going to um, have some muscle weakness, some depressed reflexes, and you can also have some cardiac arrhythmias with this. Calcium, calcium imbalances, hypercalcemia, again hyper, and then the CALC refers to calcium and the emia blood. That's a uh, calcium level higher than 5.8. Um, this can result from uh, overactive parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, uh, and underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism. Remember we learned with the endocrine system how those two things, those two glands work to control your calcium level. Um, alkalosis can also lead to some hypercalcemia. Um, this inhibits depolarization, um, specifically in the synapse, the neuromuscular junction, because um, it's needed there to uh, start a muscle contraction. So this can lead to muscle weakness, depressed reflexes, and again, cardiac arrhythmias. Hypocalcemia over here, low calcium levels. It's a calcium level lower than 4.5. Um, just like when hypercalcemia can result from an overactive parathyroid, hypocalcemia can result from an underactive parathyroid or an overactive thyroid. Uh, acidosis, diarrhea can also pull calcium out of your body. Um, this increases the excitation of nerves and muscles, which can lead to muscle spasms and tetany, uh, which besides the fact that they're very painful, can also be dangerous. So acid-base balance um, is another one. We learned about the pH scale way back at the beginning, I think in the very first week. The pH of blood ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. That's a pretty narrow range. The acid-base balance, the pH, really influences the homeostasis of your body. Even a slight deviation from this can be fatal if it's not corrected soon enough. And your body uses some chemical buffers and some physiological buffers to help keep these acid bases in balance. Chemical buffers include bicarbonate, uh, phosphate, and protein buffer systems. They use a weak base to bind with hydrogen ions and a weak acid to release them. It's a continuous equation, and I'll have this on a little poster for you, where carbon dioxide and water come together to form bicarbonate, which then splits to form hydrogen and HCO3, carbonic acid. Sorry, uh, drew a blank on that for a minute. Uh, this equation goes back and forth. Uh, in both directions, depending on if your body needs to raise or lower its pH at all. Physiological buffers are the respiratory and the urinary systems. Your lungs will expel CO2, carbon dioxide, to lower the pH, and your kidneys will expel hydrogen ions to lower the pH. The respiratory control of pH, there's chemoreceptors in your brainstem that detect uh, a decline in the pH because of the uh, accumulation of CO2. Uh, those chemoreceptors signal the respiratory centers to increase the rate and the depth of breathing so that the lungs can blow off CO2. That way less CO2 is available to combine with water to form carbonic acid, 
oh, see, I had that equation wrong when I told it to you, to form carbonic acid. Um, and that way the concentration of hydrogen ions decreases and the pH rises. Normally the lungs expel CO2 at the same rate that metabolic processes produce it, which keeps the pH in balance. But if the CO2 begins to accumulate, then this buffer system will kick in. The renal control of the pH, the kidneys will expel hydrogen ions and reabsorb bicarbonate. Uh, the kidney, this is the only buffer system that will actually expel the hydrogen ions from the body. Um, and the renal one, the kidneys, this is the most powerful buffer system, but it's also the slowest to respond. Not all buffer systems act simultaneously. The chemical buffers respond first, and they can usually restore pH within a fraction of a second. They're pretty quick. If that doesn't work, if, you're, if your uh, pH is still out of whack, then the respiratory system will respond within one to two minutes, really. The renal system can take as long as 24 hours to start to work. So uh, hopefully you don't have to get to where your renal system is going to help control your pH. Respiratory imbalances of, of acid base result from an excess or a deficiency of CO2 or carbon dioxide. And then metabolic imbalances result from an excess or deficiency of bicarbonate. This is going to be important to remember when you get to the respiratory system and you talk about uh, arterial blood gases and what they mean. So in acidosis, plasma contains uh, too much hydrogen. As the body tries to achieve acid-base balance, hydrogen moves out of the plasma and into the cells. Uh, by the hydrogen moving in, hydrogen is a cation because it's got a positive charge. So now it's inside the cell, it changes the polarity of the cell. In order to restore it, potassium will move out of the cell as the hydrogen moves in. Um, so acidosis can lead to hyperkalemia as well. And we just learned that that's really not a good thing either. In alkalosis, plasma has a low concentration of hydrogen. So hydrogen will move out of the cells and into the plasma while potassium moves out of the plasma and into the cells. As a result, alkalosis can lead to hypokalemia. Um, we talked about that a little while ago. The very last thing, respiratory uh, compensation for acid-base balances. So if your pH is too low, you're in acidosis and it's metabolic acidosis, the respiratory center is gonna increase the rate of respirations. Um, this increased rate uh, has the effect of, uh, we say, blowing off carbon dioxide, which raises your pH. Remember, if your pH is low, you're too acidic, um, and you want to get your, your pH back up into that 7.35 to 7.45 range. In alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis, the pH is too high, so it's above 7.45. Your breathing is going to slow down, which causes you to retain some carbon dioxide, and your pH will drop. Respiratory compensation is powerful, but it doesn't eliminate fixed acids like lactic acid or the ketone bodies. Renal compensation is also necessary to restore balance when in those situations. And again, I said before, the kidneys are the most effective regulators of pH, but they take several hours, sometimes days, to respond. Uh, in response to acidosis, so your pH is too low, your kidneys are going to eliminate hydrogen um, into the urine and reabsorb more bicarbonate into your bloodstream to bring your pH back up into its normal range. Um, in a case of alkalosis where your pH is too high, the kidneys hang on to that hydrogen, put it back into the bloodstream, and they'll excrete the bicarbonate so that your pH can come back down into that range. Um, it's a little complicated. I do have an acid-base experiment that hopefully we're going to be able to do that maybe will clear it up a little bit more for you, help you realize really what's going on. Um, but it's, it's important to know what can happen when you have the imbalances of the electrolytes and imbalances of fluid. Both of them kind of go hand in hand, and then the imbalance of the acid base uh, and the, your pH getting out of that very narrow 7.35 to 7.45 range.